Okay, so we were talking last time about uh, fitting models and estimating parameters uh, using. What is the lights different? Oh, okay. <laughs> that is so bright. Yeah. Um, and uh, where I left off. Um, was talking about these uh, uh, models where you um, actually is this where I left off? I think it's where I left off. I can look at the slides. Um, enough to see. Um, so we talked about this, uh, you know, uh, linear nonlinear Poisson model uh, for spiking. We also talked about the fact that you can apply the same spike trig trigger triggered average idea not just to neural data but to behavioral data. Um, uh, this was one of those slides. Uh, where you do a button press triggered average called the classification image. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> and where we ended, this is, uh, this is our goal, is the last slide I had up, actually this was, uh, which is that there's math behind all of this that says that it's a nicely uh, convex problem, which is to say for <clears throat> many of the uh, nonlinearities that one might want to consider, um, you know, for example, exponential power function. It's kind of the last thing I said last time. Um, fitting this model isn't hard. That the cost function's convex in the parameters, meaning you can just do gradient descent. You can fit this model to data. So that's a nice thing. All that's very nice. It's a nice model. It's not mechanistic uh, in, you know, in terms of neural channels and low-level neural biochemical stuff. It's more of a computational model of what neurons might be doing for some task. Uh, and you can fit it. But because it's a model you can work with, it doesn't make it right. And as we said probably in the very first day when Arrow chatted about the course, models are useful, but all models are wrong. Uh, and this model may not be adequate for data to which you want to fit it. So I'm going to talk for a little while about ways in which that LNP model, linear followed by nonlinearity followed by Poisson, uh, might fail. Um, it might fail because you don't have enough data to fit it, and so that your fit parameters won't be all that trustworthy. Um, it um, does converge reasonably quickly, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, it will fail if you don't carry out your experiment in the way in which it was designed, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so one of the ways in which it was designed, and that proof that I outlined on the board uh, last time, on Tuesday, um, required that the set of stimuli that you use be spherically symmetric. Um, <clears throat> it'll fail um, if your nonlinearity is even. Uh, in other words, if you have a complex cell rather than a simple cell, uh, because when you do the spike trigger average, you'll get something like zero, because uh, uh, deviations in this direction and this direction will both contribute equally and so they'll cancel out. Um, it'll fail uh, if it's just a wrong model meaning a receptive field is not the right way to think about it. It will fail uh, if the model is not independent over time, because it assumed independence over time in the way that I talked about it. So I'm going to talk about all these kinds of failures along the way. So first of all, about, about the uh, uh, finite data question. Uh, the more data you have, uh, you know, the better you do. That's statistics. That's true of anything that you do. Um, and so, you know, uh, you're trying to estimate a lot of stuff, so the more stimulus dimensions you have, the harder the problem is, and the more data you have, the better off you are. So if you rate how it's doing in terms of um, error, fractional error, um, as a function of this ratio, you know, you need to go up pretty high to get the error down. So you need lots of spikes. Um, so you need debt or lots of button presses either way. So, you know. I'm surprised these numbers on this graph are so low because certainly uh, when you do psychophysics, you're usually way over here. <laughs> um, okay, so that's one, one issue. Another issue is that you have to satisfy the um, demands, the requirements of the method. And one of those requirements was that the noise be spherically symmetric. So we talked about in all the experiments so far, um, we showed random stimuli with um, uh, with, you know, this is in the, the white noise um, analysis of neurons version, uh, we showed random stimuli which were, you know, bars changing over time, drawn independently, 
drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And you know that if you, uh, that the Gaussian distribution, where if, if it's identically distributed in all axes, meaning in all pixels and times, uh, that's a multivariate Gaussian with, an, uh, uh, with a diagonal, you know, multiple of the, I of the identity covariance matrix, and that is a circular symmetric thing, right? It doesn't spike out along the dimensions. It's nice and circular, spher or spherical, as you will. But suppose you do something else. For example, suppose uh, instead of having some nice circularly symmetric distribution of stimuli, uh, you only use a finite number of stimuli. So a, a sparse noise, so that it's either gray, or it's white and, and black, or it's black and white, or it's, sorry, uh, yeah, white and gray, gray and white, black and gray, uh, gray and black, for example. There's only two dimensions to make it. It's multidimensional. But suppose the noise is sparse. It's not all possible noises. We could do something. Well, this is obviously not spherically symmetric because if there's something here, it should also be here. It should also be here. It isn't. And so uh, the idea is if the true uh, receptive field is pointing in this direction, but you only use these four places, that proof that required things that are symmetric around the axis, that proof that said this will contribute equally with that, and that's why you're going to get the right answer on average, that I did on Tuesday, that proof can't work here because this is in the ensemble of stimuli I used and the symmetrically opposite one around the true value. And this true value, of course, you don't know what it is. You're trying to estimate it. But that doesn't exist. So that proof fails. And so you'll make a spike-triggered average that could be off by quite a lot. Okay? So you'll have a biased estimation procedure if you don't satisfy the requirements of the method. Now, it's not obvious why it's biased in this example, but it becomes much more obvious in this one. So suppose, instead of having everybody be independent and Gaussian distributed, you have every pixel be independent and uniformly distributed, for example, from black to white. So you just pick your pixel values randomly and independently, all pixel values equally likely. So that means your distribution is not circularly symmetric. It's a rectangle. And, you know, it's a square, actually. It's a cube or a cube to the n dimension power, okay? So that's not spherically symmetric. Uh, so if your true k is this line, well, here's some guys you tested, and here's some guys you couldn't test because their contrasts were bigger than one. And so when you ran the algorithm, there was a line perpendicular to it where out here, uh, you know, you get spikes, and in here you wouldn't get spikes. And so the red ones are spikes, and the blue ones are non-spikes. But look at the asymmetry. There's a lot more of them up here and very few of them down here because the spherical symmetry was missing. And so when you average all the red points, you get an arrow that's pointing in the wrong direction. So this is just saying that that proof I used required that symmetry around the unknown uh, receptive field vector direction. And that if you don't satisfy that, your estimates will be biased. And the bias will be depend will depend on the receptive field. If the receptive field pointed up here, you'd be biased this way. If the receptive field points down here, you're biased up this way. Where are you biased towards? You're biased towards the symmetries in the noise distribution that you used for your stimuli. You're biased towards the corners. So if, you, you know, if the real receptive field was here, you'd be biased down here. If the real receptive field was here, you'd be biased up here. So you've built in a bias in your estimation procedure, and it's a very regular bias. That's, that's a bad thing. Okay? So don't do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, what if um, the ability of me to fire now depends not just on now, but stuff that happened in the past? So that's not Poisson. The model was LNP, linear receptive field, goes through nonlinearity, and then random coin flips in every little teeny piece of time. Independent coin flips. Suppose that Spiking history matters. Um, so when would spiking history matter? There's some neuroscience people here. When does the probability of a spike depend on whether you've spiked recently? And what is that dependence called? Intro to neuroscience. Most of you have had it at some level. If I just spiked and I have a lot of excitatory input, am I going to spike one millisecond later? Nobody remembers this. Truly? 
is the word refractory. Sound familiar? Yeah, right? Neurons have a refractory period, right? How do neurons work? They produce these spikes. They, well, how do the spikes happen? A bunch of sodium goes rushing into the neuron. That creates the, the spike. Then a bunch of potassium uh, you know, flows out of the neuron. That ends the spike. Now that sodium and potassium are on the wrong sides of the membrane, you've got to get them back. There's this pump that does that, sodium-potassium exchange pump. It takes a while to run. And so you get this absolute refractory period for millisecond and a half or something, where you cannot possibly spike again, no matter what your input is. And then a relative refractory period is the pump keeps running until you get the um, ion balance back to where it was, back to baseline. And then your ability to fire goes back to what it used to be. So you have this dependency over time. So neurons, we like to model them as Poisson, because Poisson distribution is really easy to understand. But at high firing rates, they're not Poisson, because there is a dependence on my ability to spike now based on whether I've spiked in the recent past. And so our model, in order to reflect that, is going to need some added elements that it doesn't yet have. Uh, so we'll talk about how to do that. Um, other ways in which you'll be limited that I'll uh, talk, not talk about as much, uh, if you have a symmetric nonlinear, if you have a complex cell, then you need to have a, a model that can handle that uh, and a way of measuring it. Uh, you also have a problem if the stimulus distribution you're talking about doesn't drive your uh, neurons very well. So in particular, V1 complex cells don't get driven very well by white noise. Leave V1 and go later on down the line, V2, V4, IT, really don't get driven well by white noise. Okay? But they get driven well by something. Uh, so in particular, V1 neurons are highly responsive to edges and lines. And V2 neurons seem to combine multiple edges and multiple orientations as if they're doing text tree stuff, at least Tony's lab would say so. And so that rather than having a random series of stimuli that are independent pixels, you can have a random series of stimuli that are independent features, where the features individually can drive the neural population you're talking about. So when you move to V4 or IT, maybe you take a distribution of orientated edges and have a stimulus be a combination of those, a sum of those. And so you can use the same sort of math, except for the basis elements are no longer pixels, they're edges, or bars, or something. So there are ways to extend the technique in the stimulus domain to still do what we're talking about, but to pick a stimulus domain that drives the neurons better. Another benefit of that, this is a Dario Ringnach paper from quite a few years ago, um, you know, when you drive neurons with independent pixel white noise and you want to understand their dynamics. Remember, when we used bars, we had six bars and eight, oh, now eight bars and six time steps, so we're already 48 dimensional. I showed you an example <coughs> where it was independent pixels on a much deeper grid, so let's say it was 15 by 15 by 10 time steps. So that's 2,000 parameters in the model. Ridiculously high dimensionality. If you want to get better estimates, because at 2,000 your estimates are going to be flaky unless you hold the cell for hours, which you're not going to do, um, that you might want to reduce the dimensionality of your stimuli. So if you want to understand dynamics and you know you're in V1 where edges and bars matter, why not have your stimulus ensemble be multiple time steps, but be edges of random orientation and maybe two faces. So you now, instead of having you know, 20 by 2400 pixels, you now have, say, 16 orientations in two phases, so you reduce from 400 to 30. So big gain in your ability to estimate. So this one you can get around by designing collections of stimuli that satisfy the math, but that also satisfy the needs of being able to drive the neurons or the behaviors if you're doing a button press uh, a little more strongly. Uh, oh, I forgot this is a bill. So, uh, we're going to talk about this one, which is to have it dependence like history. Um, we've sort of talked about this one a little bit, because uh, I showed you an example where you had spike triggered, not, not only spike triggered average running the thing, but spike triggered covariance, meaning the way neurons covary with each other, how much does that affect the response? So quadratic inputs, uh, not just a linear input uh, to the final uh, spiking thresh, uh, nonlinear threshold. Um, and subspace analyses are just ways to reduce dimensionality before you do that. Um, and as I, uh, oh, um, and this fancy have LNP um, 
be post put as a post processor after you first give it some afferent inputs that have done some analysis. That's my idea about if you're talking about V2, give it a V1 up front and have it have as inputs not pixels but outputs of V-run neural neurons or outputs of features. So that that's what this means. Okay, but let's deal with uh, the top one. So let's take our model, which is this bit. That's the model we had, L. NP, linear, nonlinear Poisson. And let's give it some uh, dependence on time. And the way we do that is every time we have a spike, we're going to have another waveform that comes back in and adds in. So we're going to take the output, convolve it with some waveform. We don't know what the waveform is. We're going to estimate it and have that contribute in addition to the input going through the receptive field. So we've added a new stage. We've added a new bunch of parameters to estimate. There are a variety of ways to do this. You can try to estimate everything. The version I'm going to do uh, freezes this and measures this and this. At least as I recall, that's what the next slide is. Uh, there are variety, but it, again, there are various ways to do this. Um, and uh, what is this trying to account for? Well, it's trying to account for the refractory period, that's for sure. So neurons care about recent... Uh, um, so neurons having a time dependence of spiking there are a variety of processes that can give rise to that. One of them is a refractory period. So if you inhibit the hell out of the neuron right after a spike, that's effectively saying, I have a refractory period. Okay? Um, but there may be longer term ones. So there may be longer term things that we would think of more as spike adaptation. If I'm firing at a high rate, maybe I turn my gain down a little bit. So not just refractory period, but general notions of adaptation. When you say neurons or humans adapt, to recent conditions, you're saying that there's a history dependence. And so including something like this allows you to have a history dependence. Um, okay, what is this slide? I don't even remember this slide. Um, okay, uh, so if you give it a constant input, um, and this is the feedback uh, that you get, um, you know, so it's got this little bit of negative stuff. You're just going to get, uh, uh, what, what is this first one? I actually don't remember this slide at all. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this. This is, this is about adaptation, where adaptation is building up here. And this is kind of the opposite of adaptation, where things burst. But I, I really don't remember these slides being here. Uh, wow. Get past them all. I really don't remember them being there. In fact, I think they used to be hidden. So I'm confused. Maybe I unhid them without noticing I did so. Um, okay, so that model I'm talking about with the feedback. So uh, remember, uh, actually, I should go back and remind you of why we're doing this in the first place, which is uh, this slide. Wow, it's back quite a ways. Did I just pass it? Yeah, that slide. Uh, so this was retinal ganglion cells, what they actually produced, and this is what the Poisson model produced, which is it produced spikes where there weren't any, it didn't produce as many spikes where there where it should have been as it did. There were obviously some mismatches. So now we elaborate the model the way I just said. Um, and fit it again. Um, and so it's going to estimate a receptive field, center surround with some temporal dynamics, and it's going to estimate this feedback thing. This is, as I said, we froze the forward nonlinearity being that convex thing, and now estimate these guys. Yet again, there's math, Liam Paninsky up at Columbia is awesome, and there's math that says this also is fittable, <laughs> meaning it's convex, you can just do gradients, descend, it's not going to get stuck in a local minimum, you can actually fit this model. Uh, and when <laughs> Uh, you fit this model to um, ganglion cells, you get this, you know, this 3D receptive field. Here's a temporal cut through the receptive field um, uh, that uh, shows that my firing rate now, you know, depends on immediate past, but also has this um, uh, opposite sign further back. That was visible here by right of that fact that this is time, this axis. And so you have this receptive field that looks like on center, off surround. If you look back in the past, it looks like off-center, on-surround with lower weights. But um, that's, that, that was a temporal cut through there showing you this uh, change of sign. Uh, but you also get this thing, which basically says I have an absolute refractory period, and then I have a relatively refractive period, and then possibly a rebound on the other side of it. That's the feedback that 
yeah, estimated by this process. So here's retinal ganglion cells. Here's the basic LNP model that fits okay but not great. And here's the model with the feedback. And notice that all the spiking in here has been quashed. It's been cleaned up. That uh, this looseness of the Poisson rate tightened up with the input much more. Uh, and it's even better than, oh, and that the, uh, the uh, marginals, being the firing rates, uh, black is the, sorry, gray is the data, black is the new model, red was the previous model, so it fits better over here in terms of firing rates. Um, it uh, covers, uh, accounts for more of the variance. It's kind of substantially, big substantially. But here's a bit of a, cool result. So if you take this little rectangle here and um, sort the very, so you remember each row here is a trial because you show the same stimulus to the neurons over and over again and you show the same stimulus to the models over and over again and all of them have stochastic elements. If you sort them by when the first spike occurred, so this is the data, look at, you get these volleys. They're not perfectly in sync but you get these volleys. A refractory period will do that to you after a spike. You can't spike for a while, so the next spike, even though the stimulus is useful, is going to come a little while later. And after that spike, the next one's going to come a little while later. The original data didn't do that. Why? Because it's Poisson. There's no temporal dependence. Poisson just says, I, get, I have good input, I want a spike. And so you just get random spiking, like Poisson. But the new model with this feedback does exactly what the data do. Okay, so when you, when you hone in, you see some other characteristics of the data that are now getting accounted for. Um, okay, what, oh, and here's the same thing for a later window, which shows the same kind of behavior, okay, where this model reflects that way better than the Poisson one does. Okay, now, neurons, if you measure lots of them, and these data, uh, I assume, came from E.J. Chichelnitsky, uh, who is a buddy to many people here. Uh, he's at Stanford. Uh, EJ does awesome work on retina. He waits until somebody in another lab uh, has a monkey experiment and is ready to sacrifice the monkey, and he takes the retina and puts it in a dish, keeps it alive for a long time in the dark, has a CCD camera that can provide stimulation to neurons, has them sitting on a, an array such that he can measure hundreds and hundreds of retinal neurons simultaneously of different types, ganglion cells, okay? Very cool experiments. And you can measure not only single firings, but because you're measuring them all, you can measure how neurons fire together. So in neural populations, one is often concerned with uh, neural uh, cor spiking correlations. Um, and one talks about that in two different ways. One talks about signal correlations and noise correlations. So we generally have this idea, and this is going to feed into the stuff I'm going to talk about last today. Uh, and I might even end early. I think <laughs> I was like that, and I know everybody else was. <laughs> so if this is orientation, right? So orientation preference of neurons. So if this is orientation of a stimulus going like this. And I'll show you this on slides later, but neurons in V1, we're in we're in retina now, but I'm going to move to V1 for a second with the example. Neurons at V1 have receptive fields that care about orientation. So they'll have tuning curves. This might be a neuron. This neuron likes left diagonal stuff that lands on it, can respond to stuff that's at similar orientation, won't respond to stuff that's parallel. There'll be other neurons, so here's a second neuron, and here's a third neuron that's nearby. Okay? So those are three neurons. Now those neurons get input from, you know, LGN, you know, indirectly from the retina. And uh, if I show a left diagonal stimulus, this guy's going to respond a lot. These guys are going to respond also because it's within their tuning curves. Which means as I look at different stuff, these three neurons are going to tend to fire together. Not perfectly, but when the stimulus is close to their preferences, they have overlapping preferences. So they will tend to follow each other in terms of firing. They'll fire a lot together, they'll fall very little together because their tuning curves are correlated. So we refer to those as signal correlations. They are, have correlated firing 
because they are sensitive to the same aspects of the stimulus. Okay? But suppose you show the same stimulus over and over and over again. Now, neurons are noisy. You show the stimulus once, they fire 50 spikes. You show it again, they fire 48. You show them again, they fire, fire 53. And you show the same stimulus again and again to all three of these neurons. So these neurons will fire a little less than that one. That's already known. That's about their signal correlations. But now we're not changing the stimulus. We're just showing the same stimulus over and over again. Now if these guys go up and down together, it's because of the noisiness of the firing rate is not independent per neuron. It's not like this guy gets his input and he's Poisson, and this guy also gets his input and he's Poisson, and there's no shared noise. But if the input's coming from LGN, or if the interactions between different neurons are such that even the randomness feeds into multiple neurons, then we may see that they're still somewhat correlated. Less, signal's not changing, so the signal correlations are not gone, but they may still be correlated. We refer to those as noise correlations. That something about the circuit properties, about the way things are wired together, is that some of the sources of noise between neurons might be shared. And typically, neurons in both retina, LGN, V1, do have noise correlations, which the only way you discover them is by playing the same, same stimulus more than once. That's the, the way you can learn about noise correlations. So here's a retina. <laughs> And here's a bunch of ganglion cells that were measured in a piece of retina by, by EJ. Uh, and you ask about, you know, here's one of the ganglion cells I'm talking about, and here's some nearby on cells. Uh, and uh, I forget exactly what's being... Oh, right. And so here's a bunch of retinal ganglion cells, and here's uh, their uh, cross-correlations. That's why there's six plots here. I'm comparing this guy to these other six guys. Um, and uh, the ganglion cells are having these correlations that, uh, you know, peak at, uh, so you, when you cross-correlate firing or firings or spikes, you have to pick uh, a time difference, because I may always fire 10 milliseconds later than you or 10 milliseconds earlier than you, so you have a correlation curve that depends on delta t, and it, you know, all these guys seem to have a peak cross-correlation <coughs> cross at zero, meaning simultaneous spikes occur more often than you might expect. Um, and black is from data of actual neurons, and if you model as neurons is separately, using the model we were just talking about, the recursive LNP model, so for each of those neurons you take all the data you got, you fit the recursive LNP model, and now you run all those recursive LNP models on the input and measure cross correlations, what you get is less. As if there's something else in the circuit whereby these neurons are not just looking at the input and then doing their recursive LNP thing, but they must be talking to each other. Maybe directly talking to each other, or maybe their inputs have noise in them that's, that's correlated, or maybe there's some major circuit property that leads to this. But in order to, uh, oh, sorry. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, so we're gonna talk about a development of the model that, uh, what's the and for coral couples. Uh, we're going to talk about an extension of the model where uh, the model allows them to talk to each other. Uh, and that can drive these correlations up to match the data. So how do we do that? So we add one more box to the model. So up here is a recursive LNP, as we just start, discussed. Down here is a different neuron with perhaps a different receptive field, another recursive LNP. But now we let them talk to each other. Okay through yet another um, impulse response function. So when a spike happens here, this also adds into this guy. So they now become correlated by right of a function, and it's got dynamics that get estimated. So now, we've added a whole bunch more parameters, so you've got to worry about having more parameters than your data can support. And so we do dimensionality reduction to have this model have not too many parameters. So this is not just any old, it can bounce in any old way. It's a function that's built out of basis functions, little bumps. And so we estimate how much of each bump to create this curve. And so we pick a, a set, a slow dimensional space of functions that we're going to consider that are smooth or whatever for these two guys. Um, but otherwise, the fitting procedure is much the same, uh, but you estimate these extra curves. And when you do that, uh, so uh, here's a, yeah, 
So you've got a set of guys that you're, uh, you know, multiple neurons that you're fitting simultaneously, not just two like I showed you, but a bunch. And you fit them simultaneously as if they can talk to each other. Um, and you get these, um, okay, which, uh, which thing here is which? Um, these are the coupling filters uh, onto, on, no, sorry, remind myself. Oh, this, yeah, this is off to off, this is on to off, this is on to on, and this is off to on, what you uh, measure. Uh, the post spike filters that get fit to look just like the old ones, which are with a refractory period. Uh, the temporal impulse responses look much like they used to, which is to say, I'm on center, but way in the past I'm, I'm off center. And here I'm off center, but way in the past I'm on center. Um, I don't remember what the blue curves, is that a different cut? Is that a different neuron? I actually don't remember. Um, <clears throat> but you also get these interaction filters, and once you do that, um, as I, uh, <coughs> the slides are out of order, unless this is a build. Yeah, the slides are out of order. The slide that should be there is that one, <laughs> which shows that this fixes it. <laughs> okay, I did not notice that. Uh, now, we're going to move, you know, I'm not going to, yeah, I think we're going to, despite the fact that I prepped a bunch of new material, uh, I think we're going to go without a break and end early, which will be good for you, but it'll be Sorry, it's all uh, um, so you can ask, with this model, you've got the data, and which is just a bunch of neurons and their firing rates, and then you have all these models that are trying to imitate them. And uh, you can ask, if I look at the outputs of um, these models, what do I know about the stimulus? So where I'm moving to is all the models so far are, I know what that stimulus was, and I have data from neurons or behavior, and I have this model, can it generate behavior that looks like the behavior of the system I'm studying, the human or the neurons? So that's encoding. It's asking, let's model how stimuli are encoded by this device, this human or this set of neurons. Uh, but there's a second problem that we haven't talked about much this, this semester, although we certainly did when we talked about linear discriminants, which is I have a bunch of neural firing rates, and they're just firing rates in area V1. Eventually, the monkey's going to make an eye movement or, or an arm movement to tell me what they saw, which means the rest of the brain has to read V1 and do something with its output. So how do you decode from V1 or wherever you're studying what was on the display, because the monkey has to do that also. And so you might ask, what information is available in there, <clears throat> and how, how would one decode it? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, about decoding. And so what this is trying to say is, if I try to figure out what a stimulus was on the screen, and how much information does this population have about the stimulus that's on the screen, and I count that in information theoretic terms. This is a course that has never talked about information theory. Information theory takes probability distributions and turns them into how much information about, about the stimulus do I have in units of decisions, binary decisions, bits, bits like bits in a computer. Okay? So if you only learn one bit, you can make a yes-no decision. That's basically what that's saying. And so this is counting how many bits of information do I have about the stimulus that was on the screen by just doing you know, like a fishy to fishy linear discriminant on the, on the cells versus you know, outputs of these various models. And it turns out that this uh, allowing the neurons to interact can in fact improve uh, information content. Um, there's a whole line in uh, neuroscience talking about uh, decorrelation as a useful thing to do. So that stimuli on a screen, when you walk around a natural environment, you know, there's pixels that are correlated, right? This is white and this is white. Uh, and so that sending all those signals to the brain of this is white, this is white, this is white, this is white, is redundant and it's wasting information. And so people sometimes talk about, let's go back to a, a center surround somewhere, well that's not a very visible center surround. But okay, here's a center surround. That the idea of having a center surround is a way of decorrelating the input. So if you have a uniform field, this guy is sending zero up to the brain. Why waste spikes? 
on a uniform field. But if there's some contrast available, there's dark next to light. That's useful. And so send that. And so a ganglion cell positioned around here will see some contrast and will send something up to the brain. But a ganglion cell centered right here will see a uniform field and won't send anything. This goes back to Horace Barlow, but plenty of other people have talked about, you know, that the retina and then later V1 may be built to decorrelate the different neurons. Now you cannot perfectly decorrelate them because there's signal correlations. This neuron and this neuron will always be correlated. So it's not like you can drive them to zero, but you can at least reduce them so that you don't need as many neural spikes because spikes are costly. They're energy costly. You don't need as many neurons if there isn't that much information. And so, uh, you know, you have lots and lots of rods, but you don't have that many cables in the optic nerve. You join them up. You let them converge because in low light conditions, you want them to converge because there's not much light. And uh, on the other hand, you don't do that uh, for the uh, gang, you know, for the um, cones in most of the retina. You have two ganglion cells per cone, effectively, you have these major ganglion cells. So you're basically deciding how much information do I want to transmit. Okay, so this idea of reading out, this is the last few slides and we'll be done quite soon. We'll see how, how fast this goes. Uh, Weiji Ma, in his first uh, and, and one of his best known papers with uh, Jeff Beck, um, Peter Lankham, and Alex Pouget, asked about you want to read out from neurons, neurons encoding something, what's the right way to read out from them, and what does that mean in terms of computations you might want to do with populations of neurons? So the, the canonical example everybody always uses is this. Okay? So suppose we have a population of neurons in a given location that are encoding orientation. So they have various tuning curves, and suppose they're LNP. So they have a receptive field they put on the stimulus, maybe there's a nonlinearity, and then they're possible. Okay? And what you have are the responses of all these neurons. So here's a bunch of noisy responses of neurons. This was the stimulus, you have all these different spikes, and you want to estimate what orientation was on the screen. So let's go back to what we were doing all semester, max likelihood. Okay? So that means we need a likelihood function. But we have Poisson spikes, and we know the Poisson distribution. So each neuron is firing spikes in a Poisson fashion. This is the Poisson distribution written right here. But let's look at the elements. So we have a bunch of neurons indexed by I. Neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We've got a bunch of neurons. And on any given trial, we have data. And the data is a vector indexed by I which is, how many spikes did I get from this neuron? How many spikes did I get from this neuron? How many spikes did I get from this neuron? So that vector is the data that you've collected, and now you'd like to relate that to how would the monkey, or human, reading those spikes in a later brain area, try to determine what's on the screen. They want to estimate what the stimulus was. So R is the data, it's a vector. Theta is the thing we don't know because we're in a stripped-down experiment where the, the, the participant is trying to estimate orientation. So I'd like to calculate a posterior distribution. What's the probability of every possible orientation given the data that I have? So first you do Bayes' rule, as we've been doing all semester. So you flip this conditional. What's the probability of getting that set of spikes given this orientation on the screen times any prior distribution you, you might have had? <clears throat> which could be a environmental prior that you have grown up and that you know. <clears throat> and for orientation, uh, not only in carpentered environments like the one we're in right this second, but also in the woods, verticals are, and horizontals are more frequent than obliques. And people have shown this, including in work I did with Arrow, with uh, a postdoc, Anna Gershik, that if you take large collections of images and take little patches, and say, does this patch have a dominant orientation? Okay, what is it? And then collect a histogram. You get a function that, on the same axis as this, uh, looks like it peaks at vertical and it peaks at horizontal. Okay? So there is a P of theta that you may carry around 
that gives you biases and estimation, and we have demonstrated that people do that um, in behavioral experiments, so that you may have a prior, and so you may want to include the prior in this, and so that's what's sitting right here. Uh, or your experimental prior might be flat, and you throw this away and just do max likelihood. Either way, this is a likelihood, right? How do you know this is a likelihood? Because the thing to the left of the con conditional sign is the thing you know. The thing on the right is the thing you don't know. It's a function of theta. Okay, sometimes written L of theta. Okay? Uh, but it's a probability distribution. If theta is on the screen, how many spikes, you know, how likely is it to get this set of spikes? If the neurons are independent, okay, I just got through a population coding model where they're not independent, but now we're going back to independent, then the probability of getting the full thing is the product of the individual probabilities per neuron. The probability per neuron is this is Poisson spiking. And so the Poisson distribution is the appropriate distribution. So you have to know what the rate is. Well, these curves give you the rate. If we're talking about, let's change colors, if we're talking about this specific theta right here, theta, I should give it a, another name, but I'll just give it be the red theta. So in neuron number one, this is the rate. In neuron number two, this is the rate. In neuron number three, this is the rate. We've got the rates. We can read it right off our, our diagram here. Okay? So we have the rates. And that rate just goes into the Poisson distribution. This is how many spikes I got. This was the rate. And this is the formula for the Poisson distribution. So we can read out of this a posterior. So you can decode. You can take the set of spikes and get a posterior distribution of the probability of all the different orientations. And then with that posterior, you can pick the peak, you can pick the mean, you can add a cost function, you can make decisions. The way we've talked about when we did signal detection theory, once you have a posterior, you have the thing you need to go off and make decisions, make good decisions using various cost functions. Okay? Now the other thing that um, is in that paper, so it's an it's a awesome paper with a supplement that goes on for miles, and the supplement says it doesn't just have to be Poisson, it could be any of lots of different distributions per neuron, as long as they satisfy that they come from what's called an exponential family. So an exponential family is a particular way of writing a distribution, but it happens to include almost all the distributions you've ever heard of. So for most distributions, you can pull out a posterior that in a way similar to this, but you, for most distributions, you also get to play this wonderful game. Suppose uh, this is one population of neurons, and here's you know, me reading it out. Suppose this is a second population of neurons um, indexed by the same, you know, same thing, uh, you know, and I can read them out. And suppose for every neuron here, I have a corresponding neuron that has that preference over here. Suppose I want to combine these two sources of information. Turns out all I have to do is add up the spikes. I can just take this curve plus this curve and make a new curve and then read it out. Incredibly simple. So the idea is, suppose you're doing sensory cue integration. I've got something that's, uh, you know, a population that's telling me whether it's here, 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 or here from vision. I have another population telling me whether it's here, 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 or here from audition. I could just take those two population responses and add them. Now, when you read this out via this formula, if they're spiking more, this gets narrower. If the contrast is high, if the auditory amplitude is high, you get a narrow distribution because they're Poisson. Anybody remember why that's true? Why does more spikes help? See, we may not have said that explicitly in this, in this class. More spikes, if noise is fixed, obviously help, because the signal to noise ratio goes up, deep prime goes up, you learn. Poisson doesn't quite work like that. Poisson, the variance is the same as the mean, which means the, square, the standard deviation is the square root of the mean, which means the mean divided by the standard deviation keeps getting bigger as you get more spikes. So for a Poisson, just like constant error of noise, Things get better if you get stronger responses, but they don't get better as fast as just adding fixed noise, no matter what the, what the output is. So it gives you something that's not quite Faber's law, but it's in the direction of, that bigger things are noisier. Um, in any case, it turns out that calculations adding you know, this population's estimate to this population's estimate are just sum the spikes. And you'll do better because the more spikes you have, the signal to noise ratio gets better. Because Poisson, that's what I just told you. It gets better with the square root of number of spikes. 
And so you do better and better if you have more spikes. And so if you have two different cues and then you sum their spikes, it'll get narrower. You recall when we talked about sensory... No, that was another... The wrong class. That was perception class. I can't say that here. Take it back. <laughs> Sorry. It's all mush in my head at this point, at this point of the semester. Um, okay, so that's what their paper contributed. Later paper that's going to kind of tie together a lot of what we've done in this class, several things that we've done in the class, which is, uh, it was one of several things I talked to Arrow about, what new stuff could I do today that wasn't already on the slides. And he suggested a couple of papers. Uh, I'm going to talk about this paper because it uses techniques we've all learned uh, and ties them together in interesting ways. So this is from Tony's lab. Um, some people, some of you may have heard of or know, Mirdad Jezieri at, at MIT, Adam Cohn is at Einstein, and I don't know where on off graph is these days. In any case, multi-unit recording, macaque V1, measure lots of neurons, measure their orientation tuning curves. So this is the same x-axis as over there, and these are empirical tuning curves. This axis actually goes to 360, so that it's actually about not just orientation, but direction. And so if somebody has uh, one peak that is smaller than another peak, this guy is moderately direction tuned. Uh, but if the two peaks are exactly the same height, this guy's orientation tuned, but he's not direction selective. He doesn't care whether it's moving left or right, just does care that it's vertical. Okay? So big group of neurons. There were three data sets in the paper, never mind the details. But for any given data set, they've got a whole bunch of trials of a whole bunch of orientations. Orientations get repeated multiple times, different orientations get played, and so they have vectors of firing rates of a bunch of neurons, otherwise known as, oh, it's not on the slide, it was on the, it was on the previous slide, but we have these vectors, R, which is the firing rate, the number of spikes from each of all the neurons collected simultaneously to a stimulus, and we've got, uh, you know, so a big matrix maybe of these, you know, here's R1 and R2 and so on. And some of these would be for theta 1, and the next bunch would be for theta 2 on the screen, theta 3. That's the data. So each of a bunch of data is we have a bunch of vectors. And the question is, what does that tell us about decoding what was on the screen from that collection of vectors? What would be the best way of doing it? And what does that tell you about the neurons? Okay, well, we have these tuning curves, so rather than fitting tuning curves or may making assumptions about some, you know, odd, you know, Gaussian shape, you know, you could fit these with like a Gaussian bump and another Gaussian bump and decide what their heights are. I mean, you could do various things to smooth this out if you want to. Uh, my memory, although I didn't read the paper that carefully, is that they actually took this. The only thing they had to do is that it's bad if a tuning curve makes it all the way to zero. Because if it's zero, it can never spike, and if it does spike, that's infinitely improbable, and that makes all the math go crazy. So they made sure all these tuning curves were lifted off from the baseline by a little bit. But other than that, I don't think they did any massaging. So these are the tuning curves they use, not the nice smooth ones like I have drawn over there. Okay? And they uh, allow you to estimate what uh, is out in the world. So. This math is going to be the same math we saw before, but now we're going to carry it a little step further. So we can say, I got a bunch of spikes. I've already measured a bunch of tuning curves. So if these guys are just Poisson, I have the rate, I have the amount, I know the likelihood of every possible orientation. So you name an orientation, and let's say, here's what its log likelihood it is. And I could pick max, you know, min, I could calculate a posterior, I could do whatever you want, want me to do with it, the same stuff we've been doing. So it's the log of the product of all the individual neurons. Big assumption. That's an assumption of independence, which may or may not be true, getting there. But that's, the, that's like the you know, Mabek Puget version. We assume independence, so we just multiply them. Each of these probabilities is Poisson. I'll write it down here. OK, now actually do the log. Uh, so yeah, log of the product is the sum of the logs, as we've done, seen before. So log of this product is log of this plus minus log of this plus log of that. So here's log of this minus log of this plus log of this. Well, log of exponential is just this minus this. Okay, so it breaks up into little terms. Okay, so that's just algebra. But let's now look at the terms. We're going to want to just, you know, use the readout to do a task. 
So I might, for example, say, this is a discrimination experiment. Is it this orientation or that orientation? So I'll only be considering two of these likelihoods, and I'll do max likely. I'll pick over which ones are more likely. Okay, we're going to use this to say, how would this network behave in various circumstances? Okay? And so we're going to compare likelihoods for two different orientations or more, or do something about multiple orientations. So this term depends on orientation. This term depends on orientation. This term is just a constant on any given trial. On any given trial, you have the data. This is a constant. It's the same term for every theta. So when you're going to compare likelihoods, that's always going to cancel. You're comparing log likelihoods, so you're taking likelihood ratio log thereof, so it's log of the first one minus log of the second one, so that will always cancel. That term doesn't matter. Let's look at what else we have. So this is something that depends on theta, but not on the data, times the data. In other words, we're going to add up the outputs of all these neurons with weights. And the weights will depend on which orientation we're talking about, but it's going to be a weighted sum. It's going to be a dot product. It's a dot product, okay? Um, then this is going to depend on which data we're talking about, but not on the data, so that's like an offset. Now, that is the sum of all the tuning curves at theta. Okay? That's what that is. It says I've got lots of neurons, and I'm going to look at this data, and I'm just going to add up those numbers. So, if I have lots and lots of tuning curves, and they're very evenly spread, then no matter where I put theta, that sum will be the same. So that term will go away if I have a uniform set of neurons. But I don't. I have empirical ones that I measure, which just by luck might have more of them at 45 <coughs> degrees and less of them at 60 degrees or whatever. And so I can't just add them up and say which theta wins because 45 degrees will win more often than 60 degrees because I happen to collect more neurons at 45 degrees. That's not fair. So you have to fix it by giving some uh, theta's different boosts in order to equilibrate them. And so this does that automatically for you. Okay? So that's what we end up with. And so now let's say I wanted to, so there's various things in the paper. One is to try to uh, develop how do you pull out a whole likelihood function. And this is a likelihood, so you can do that. Uh, but another one is to say what would an observer, given these uh, neural firing rates, the full collection, the vector, what decision should they make? Okay? So suppose you act like I'm in an experiment where I'm doing a discrimination between this orientation and that orientation. We fix two orientations and say, I'm going to do a discrimination experiment. What is the calculation I will do in order to decide is it theta 1 or theta 2? Well, go back to signal detection theory. When we talked about that, you know, you want to say, here's the likelihood of this one, here's the likelihood of this one, and you want to say which one's bigger. So you can also do it in log likelihood, so you're going to subtract log likelihoods and say which one's bigger. You're going to compare it to zero. If it's bigger than zero, you'll say it's theta one. If it's smaller than zero, you'll say it's theta two. Okay? But I've also told you what this is. It's right here. This term I can safely ignore because here's exactly where it's going to cancel. And so I've got a bunch of weights times the firing rates, which I'll call capital W. Um, and I have a bunch of uh, constants that add up that end up with a big constant, but it does depend on theta. When I want to compare two of them, I'm going to take two of these and subtract one from the other. Uh, yeah, and so here's the weights for theta 1, here's the weights for theta 2, and I'm subtracting from each other, so that means I'm just going to get a new set of weights, which are a difference of the we weights, so it's just a new weight vector. And I'm going to get these constants for theta 1 and theta 2 and subtract them, so I'm going to get a new constant, which will depend on the discriminanda, which two things am I comparing? Once you tell me, compare plus or minus 5 degrees, or compare plus or minus 45 degrees, once you tell me that, that turns into, effectively, a receptive field over neurons, meaning weight the neurons and add them up, and an offset that's basically equilibrating because your um, neural population doesn't have equal amounts of everything. Okay? And so we have an ideal calculation based on the assumption that I know the receptive fields, and that after the receptive field, all I get is a Poisson rate, and I get a sample from independent Poissons for every neuron. Okay? And so you can run that on stimuli and see how it behaves. 
Okay? And you can run it lots and lots of times because it has a noisy thing underneath it, or you can run it on the raw data you collected and see how often does it guess what was on the screen based on the neurons that you happen to have collected. Okay? Um, now, that's one possible model. But that model treats all the neurons independently. It acts like they're independent. But you collected all the neurons simultaneously. So if there are correlations, you actually have them in the data set. You ignored them here, but you have them. So you could take them into account. So there's an alternative model. That's fancier. And there are actually multiple alternative models. But the model they did was to train a linear discriminant. Because think about this. What are we doing? We've got these R's. And the R's are in multiple dimensional space. You know, there's output of neuron one, output of neuron two, up to however many neurons you collected. And they were, you know, third, you know, three, four, five dozen across their data sets. But here's R1, and here's R2, and now we're talking about discrimination experiments. So there's only two orientations being under consideration. There's theta one, which maybe led to a bunch of dots, and there's theta two that led to a bunch of dots. It's a familiar problem. We worked on this quite a bit. Okay? And you could do Fisher's linear discriminant. You could do any number of models, as we've talked about. Now, the model they already had in the previous slide is none of the ones we studied. I mean, it is a discriminant, right? Because a discriminant is do a weighted vector and put a criterion on it. So this is a linear discriminant trying to do a binary task. Okay? We're, we're right back in classification of two categories using math that you've seen before. However, these weights are not prototype. These weights are not based on equal covariance like Fisher's linear discriminant. These weights were determined based on the Poisson which is to say, dots up there have a different variance than dots down here. It's not about the category's variance, it's about the individual, you know, if the, firing rate, if the mean firing rates are right here, then the variance here is based on, you know, on this Poisson, and the variance here is based on a different Poisson. So there's going to be a stretching <laughs> along the various axes. And you can do Fisher for that, and there's a, a you know, uh, the variances of uh, the other um, category, theta 2, theta 2 has different means, which means the x mean for theta 2 and the x mean for theta 1 will be different from each other. So doing Fisher would be, in fact, an incorrect model because the two covariance matrices, this is assuming independence, so the covariance matrices are going to be aligned with the axes. They're, they're not going to be tipped because there's no correlations allowed in the model that we've talked about so far. But they're not going to be circular, because it's Poisson. The further away from the origin you are, the more variance you have. And the two different categories might be different distances away from the origin along any given axis. So we're doing the right thing to do for Poisson in this formula. Um, but it's just classification analysis, just a slightly different case than the ones we talked about. It ends up with the same exact calculation, which is a dot product with a vector that's pointing in some direction in our response space, and a criterion put on it, you know, a, a place along that vector to draw the, draw the hyperplane. Okay, that was assuming independence. But we have all these R vectors, and if the neurons are covariant, we actually know that or have estimates of it from the data. So we could say, okay, I've got a bunch of R vectors in category A and a bunch of R vectors in category B, theta 1 and theta 2. So let's just build a discriminant using a standard technique. Could have done Fisher, but we already know Fisher's probably a bad idea because even for independent, its axioms aren't satisfied. So why not just use something fancier? So they used the fancier thing that Arrow doesn't like. They used the support vector machine. They just said, I got all these vectors, and I got all these other vectors. Let's try to split them as best we can, and let's use this technique that MATLAB gives us a nice subroutine, we'll call it. Okay? And it's going to come up with a different weight vector, and it's going to come up with a different boundary, and it'll behave differently. But you could ask, does it behave better than the independent Poisson model? 
How much better? So here's what they did. They applied three different models. One, independent Poisson. Two, build the best discriminant I can, which is going to take into account the, um, uh, they call this the, so PID is the Poisson independent discriminant. ELD is the empirical linear discriminant, meaning just take the data and build a linear discriminant. And then finally, they <clears throat> did the SVM thing, except where they shuffled the data. They didn't shuffle um, categories. If it was theta 1 up there, they have a bunch of theta 1 vectors. Uh, oh, I erased my little matrix. But so suppose for you know theta, some particular theta, I've got a bunch of response vectors, neuron 1, neuron 2, up to neuron 36. Okay, so this is all the firing rates from one presentation of that orientation from another to another. Okay, I can make a new set of data vectors where I permute vertically. Meaning, if there were correlations, I've thrown them away. But mean rates and distributions of rates from individual neurons for any given, ori for any given orientation are all maintained. What I've done is I've screwed with the correlations because I've randomly permuted across trials. Okay? So I take that set of vectors across all the orientations and throw that at an SVM. That they call the correlation blind empirical linear discriminant. So you still throw it at an SVM, but you give it data that takes the correlations away. Okay? And so then they applied that and said, okay, if I give you the firing rate and then you give me your best estimate of is it theta 1 or theta 2, um, how well do you do? I also can build a whole likelihood function out of any of these. Out of the SVM, I can do a discrimination between 1 degree and 2 degrees, between 2 degrees and 3 degrees, 3 degrees and 4 degrees. So that gives me the discrimination things. Then I can accumulate them, and I can actually build a likelihood function. That's a little subtle about how you can do that, especially because it's circular, and they don't really explain that part uh, in the paper, which bugs me. But regardless, point is, from these discriminants and these individual likelihood functions, so they call this a log likelihood ratio. It isn't. It's an SVM. But act like it's liking, acting like the other one and build a likelihood function out of it. So that means I can now use both of these techniques to both estimate orientation or to do a discrimination between a known pair of orientations. So on the graph down here is one, uh, one set of their data graphs. <clears throat> this is, um, for each of these uh, devices, how well uh, does it do an estimation? And so this is a histogram of how much of a mistake it makes. So I'm going to show all my data, every vector I ever collected, run the, the model, get a likelihood function across thetas, take the max likelihood, and say, that's my estimate. But I also know what was on the screen, because I ran that trial. So I can say, how good was I? And so this is how big your errors are. Um, and as you can see, the, uh, using the correlations does better than assuming independence or using the data but quashing the correlations. So correlations actually are useful for reading out, for decoding from the population. What you have over here is just take the middle bar, the bar of zero, meaning I actually estimated correctly. By the way, they do this in discrete. Um, they do it every five degrees. The experiment was every five degrees, so they run this decoder, not continuous, but every five degrees. And so this is the proportion of times they get the right answer for different neural data sets, because they had five different data sets. Here's how many neurons were in each data set. Quite a few. Okay? And you'll notice that, the, that using the correlations wins every time by substantial margins. Um, over here. Uh, same deal, but now we're going to talk about the discrimination experiment. Oh. <laughs> I told you about the correlation blind, but I showed you correlation blind on the previous slide. So this was the correlation blind, the shuffling idea. Okay. Um, all right. So um, now we do a discrimination experiment. Now I can do um, discrimination experiments um, over and over again. Again, I'm not actually running them. I'm running my model to do a discrimination experiment. So I take from my data trials in which the uh, orientations were 5 degrees apart, 10 degrees apart, 15 degrees apart, 20 degrees apart, around the clock. And for every pair of orientations, I see how well the model does. So I get a percent correct from my models. I have the same three models. 
And so as orientation gets further and further apart, it should be easier because I'm hitting completely separate neurons. So you get a psychometric function from your models. And you can compare that to behavior, although they don't in this article, but you can also um, you know, see that you are getting more information if you include the correlations. Um, and that if you include the empirical data as opposed to this model by a receptive field, you do a little bit better. But the correlations clearly are helping you decode this population. They, are tell they have information that you can use. Now why is that? Suppose two neurons, here are two neurons, and suppose in addition to their response to the stimulus and their own independent noisiness, suppose there's a noise source that's adding to both of them equally. Suppose there's a coin flip on every trial that adds the same noise to both these guys. If that's true, then if I subtract their responses, I take A minus B, then that noise that's in there is canceled. Now, I don't want to subtract their responses because they both tell me about the stimulus, so if I subtract them, I'm also losing stimulus information. But there's a cost-benefit between taking a little bit of this guy, subtracting him off that guy, in order to cancel common noise. So when you have common noise, you can, uh, you can use it to um, ameliorate the situation by having some negative weights. Um, so uh, imagine, for example, that you, know, you have a neuron that's sensitive to this um, you know, stimulus, and a neuron that's completely insensitive. Its output on average is zero, but they both have the same noise added to them. Well, then if I subtracted this guy from this guy, I would have just canceled the noise. It's gone. So of course I'll do better. So if you know about correlations and you use it in a calculation, there's a benefit. Noise correlations I'm talking about. Um, OK, so that's the psychometric function. And you can also act like you're doing a psychophysics. You can say, OK, 75% correct on call threshold. And so you can go over and see what's the threshold for each of the models. That's what's plotted over here. Now down is good, meaning I don't have to change the orientation as much to do 75% correct. So down is good, and again, the one that takes into event, uh, account the correlations always wins, and wins by pretty substantial margins. Lastly, you can peek inside the model because you've got that weight vector, right? By the time you're done, when you discriminate between theta 1 and theta 2, this is the form of the discriminant you're doing. And each of these models has its own discriminant, meaning it has a weight vector for comparing uh, stimulus A to stimulus B, stimulus theta 1 to stimulus theta 2. So if you want to say big for theta 1 and small for theta 2, you give positive weights you know, for theta 1, negative weights for theta 2. You're taking this minus that, say. So what you see here are the weight vectors for each of the three models for two different discriminations. Now, this hides under it an interesting thing in uh, sensory neuroscience. Um, so, Let's take the same axis, my orientation axis. I got a bunch of neurons. You know, I'll change the loop and whatever. I got a bunch of neurons. No, oh, no, I can't change the loop. This one sucks. Uh, well, I have a good black. I just don't know where I put it. Um, so I got a bunch of these tuning curves from that population that I learned from. This is not a very good black one either. Um, OK, so the question is, suppose I'm doing a 90 degree uh, discrimination. Delta theta equals 90 degree. In other words, I am discriminating this one from uh, this one, plus or minus 45. Okay? So that's really far apart. There is no neuron. The guy who sees vertical is down to almost nothing by plus or minus 45. He's kind of he's useless anyway because you respond to them equally, but he doesn't even respond to them both. So you basically want to take these guys. Everybody is responsive to this guy, minus everybody is responsive to this guy. Plus, remember, more firing rate is more um, reliable because it's Poisson. Uh, well, at least in the first model, it's Poisson. Okay? And so neurons that fire more are more reliable, so they should get higher weight. So for the plus or minus uh, 90 degree case, you expect to see a curve that looks like this. Listen to the plus 45, listen to the minus 45, listen less to other neighboring guys because they're less reliable. 
And so that's the weights. That's the way you weight the evidence from the different neurons. Um, however, and so and you see that coming out of all three models. However, suppose instead delta theta is five degrees. In other words, I'm discriminating this from this. Okay. So in the plus or minus 90 degrees, I gave high weight to the guy that was uh, most sensitive to plus 45, and I gave really high weight negative to the guy who was sensitive to, to negative 45. However, the guy that's sensitive to zero is incredibly sensitive to five. Doesn't discriminate them well at all. So this idea, actually, at least the first time I read about it, was uh, in the early 80s in the psychophysics literature which is when you want to discriminate zero from five degrees, you don't want to use the guy that's sensitive to them. You want to use the guy who discriminates them, which is to say you want to, guy to use the guy whose tuning curve is maximally steep where they are. And that guy is going to peak far away. And somebody over here who's steep the other way is very useful. He's going to peak far away. And so you're going to give high weight not to the guys that are sensitive to your stimuli, but to the guys that are far away but that are steep where the stimulus are so they can discriminate between them. And so that's what you see with the weights in the plus or minus 5 degree case. You see weights extending way away from where they're sensitive to, you know, fairly insensitive to the stimuli to discriminate uh, between them. Um, and thank you. We're done. I'm so sorry that Arrow isn't here to be here for last moment because that's just not fair, but whatever. <laughs>